Allow me to introduce Ruthie Doyle, who will be our moderator for the panel today. And Ruthie has started a new initiative with the Royal Shakespeare Company, and they have some really cool stuff they want to show today. So Ruthie, when you're seated, I will throw it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Ruthie Doyle, and I am here uh, with some incredible people. Uh, I feel very uh, lucky to share the stage with them. Um, I'd love to just uh, give you a brief introduction and then we'll kind of dig into the meat of it. But we're really here to think about how are we building teams that are resi resilient? How are we building teams that make better products? How are we building teams where people are happier? Um, so hopefully uh, we'll get into that and uh, hear a little bit of your questions afterwards. Um, so I'm Ruthie Doyle. I have spent the better part of a decade at the Sundance Institute uh, in the New Frontier uh, program, labs and uh, festival side. Um, and then most recently created a new initiative um, called the Interdisciplinary Program at Sundance with the Art of Practice Fellowship. Um, and I am uh, recently now working with the Royal Shakespeare Company, working on fellowships, um, artists, and research. And I will pass it over to my colleague, um, Sarah, to give us a quick rundown. I'm Sarah, I'm Director of Digital Development at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Worked there for the past 10 years. Um, leading on artistic collaborations between technology and, and theatre and celebrating collaboration throughout our practice um, and now working with Ruthie on uh, what the future of performance looks like and how technology companies are an integral part of that and how we look at our future. And shall we play a video? Let's do it. Great. Three years ago, we spotted that 2016 was going to be a big Shakespeare year. It was Shakespeare's 400th anniversary of his death, and the Royal Shakespeare Company needed to put on something pretty spectacular. We needed to try and match the magic of Shakespeare's imagination. So I got cast a long time ago for this new production of The Tempest, and the RSC is the home of Shakespeare. Not many actors get the chance to do things like this. It's taken the best part of two years for us to develop this technology with Intel and create an avatar to make Ariel fly, to create a sense of the island being a place where magic was possible. I ordered the King's ship. You get to see two fully-fledged performances, one of which is an actor, and another is this apparition can fly around the space. To dive into the fire, to ride. We have unlimited versions of Ariel. We're able to change his form in many different ways. We are creating for the first time on stage, real time, a live facial performance capture. And that is quite an extraordinary leap forward. I and my fellows are ministers of fate. The actor both becomes the marionette and the puppeteer at the same time. And you can see their physicality completely driving one-to-one -one this digital character. Men hang and drown. We keep working, keep trying to refine the way that Ariel moves, the way he talks, and I have no idea where it's going to go. The technology that Intel deployed here for the Tempest is big. Take real-time information from a motion capture suit map that on to a complex digital avatar, and then project that digital avatar out through 27 projectors. We have their desktop i7s to take marks, skeletal information, and a machine called the Big Beast, which has 120 cores. I've never seen a technical setup like this. This place is full of huge amounts of technology, much more so than most film sets that we're on. Generally, on set, you might say, let's fix that in post. You can't do that here. The avatar has to be so robust because that's the final product. All you can do is create the play with the tools that you have now. And what's delightful about this production is that we have pretty spectacular tools. is the ability to encapsulate Shakespeare's vision, inclusive of all that magic, that wonder. 
the possibilities of what Intel have allowed are only limited by our imaginations. We're at the forefront of something that other people can take on and build. Who knows where things will be taken in the future. It's for other creative minds to see what we're doing and take it further. Back in time, those are the show, the show dates. Um, <laughs> I'm Valencia James, a wonderful creator I've had the, the pleasure to know and of uh, Volumetric uh, Performance Toolbox. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Rufi. And I, you know, that video just gave me so much goosebumps. Um, I'm actually coming to uh, the practice of live performance and uh, combining this with interactive immersive technologies from the point of view of the artist, the independent like freelancer who, you know, very low budget and like figuring out how, how do I do this? How do I tell my stories um, and, and reveal hidden histories? I'm very passionate about that, how the, puff, the, 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 the power of um, combining live performance and using these technologies to tell our stories. Um, and I got into this like uh, 10 years ago when I was curious about how um, machine learning can be combined with um, dance, because dance is my passion, and I'm very curious about movement exploration and live um, improvisation. And I started this, uh, in this slide, you're seeing like the first prototype of a project called AIM, which I started with Photon Bognar and creative technologist Gabor Pap, Gaspar Haidu, and Alexander Behrman. And we had you know, no budget, like literally, we had to figure out how do you um, create like motion capture from a very basic um, motion capture, like, a, like that sensing camera, and, and how we can create that into this avatar that can perform live and improvise live. And through a series of, of incremental um, like development, um, we were able to actually create uh, a system that can generate new movements. And, and for me, as a, as a performer, it was inspiring because I was able to um, access like new ways of moving. And uh, I found that very empowering. And so what we did was, like, with the artist's needs at the forefront, developing this work. Um, and then uh, fast forward to 2020, when uh, theaters were closed, I um, thought about, well, how can uh, performers still perform even though theaters are closed? And how can we still have these live collective experiences um, even though we can't be together? And so that led me to um, develop the Volumetric Performance Toolbox together with uh, Sor Bluey and Th Thomas Wester and Ben Purdy. And uh, together we, we were actually um, funded by iBeam um, in a fellowship where uh, we were able to develop a system that um, empowered artists. Um, we were able to develop a kit that would have a low cost, um, and it was able to, uh, the performer was able to perform in um, social virtual reality space for this collective live experience that um, people can have from their homes using just a web browser. Um, we're thinking about accessibility, and uh, for the artists as well as for the audience. And um, what was really exciting about that project, again, very um, low budget, but it was about um, creating, uh, how do you create this performance? And that creation was actually fueling the technical um, decisions and, and the actual technology that we decided to use. And so that process actually um, encompass the creation of a piece called Sugar. Um, and, and this went on. This basically told the story of the transatlantic slave trade and brought to the forefront um, the Caribbean history. Um, and also thinking about my ancestors and thinking about ancestral reverence and that connection that we have. You know, our ancestors are living within our bodies, if you think about it. And how can I um, express that? Uh, in, in this immersive way. So I'm gonna show uh, a trailer of that and um, 
and was really happy to be able to show it at Sundance um, last year. Thank you for inviting me to be on the panel, and thank you to the um, conference organizers for allowing me to be here. It's my first uh, tech conference. Um, I've worked in the arts for a long time, and um, I also have a Sundance connection. I worked there about 10 years ago, but um, have since, since I came to Stanford, I've also collaborated with Ruthie and the New Frontier program. So it's nice to extend the relationship and be working with all of you now. Um, but my name is Ellen O. Oh. I am the Director of Interdisciplinary Arts Programs in the Office of the Vice President for the Arts at Stanford. Um, it's a long name, but essentially I work in the Central Arts Office. That's kind of the umbrella organization that provides resources and operational support and campus-wide programming um, for the arts on campus. But my role specifically is really to work with campus organizations, departments, and programs to cultivate new ecosystems of interdisciplinary research and practice. So that looks like catalyzing collaborations across fields, developing new programs and platforms for people to connect and present their work. Um, and curating diverse teams of people to come together around different issues and ideas. I think, you know, the goal overall is to really demonstrate the power and impact that the arts can have in our world and how artists can really help us imagine and build new and better futures. Um, some of the ways that I do this are by building um, and managing vis vis different visiting artist programs on campus, where often the host organization or department is outside of the arts. So for example, we have a program in the Institute for Human-Centered AI, um, the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. Um, this year we are working with the medical school. So we work with very disparate fields um, and bring artists into the mix so that the artists and the practitioners can have a mutually beneficial exchange um, between the faculty and the students and the artist. I also um, lead interdisciplinary working groups of faculty mem members whose work is at the intersection of two different fields like art and technology or art and science. And it's really just developing relationships over time and creating space for people to come together to share their work and ideas and really think about new ways or better ways that we can continue to build these interdisciplinary communities. Because in places like Stanford or probably any academic institution, every, it feels very siloed. Everybody's kind of in their own building and in their own box. So um, it takes some work to create common spaces. I also provide faculty grants for people who want to do interdisciplinary creative projects, um, really to cultivate collaboration, um, again, between fields and also creative practice in fields outside of the arts. 
And of course, um, I produce a lot of public programs and events to showcase all of the great work that's being done on campus. Um, but yeah, again, the, the overall goal of my work is really to demonstrate that when you bring artists to the table, they can really catalyze discourse, um, offer new approaches, ask different kinds of questions, and I think they're really the drivers of social and cultural change. Thanks, Ellen. Yeah. So you might notice none of us are technically uh, technologists. Um, so you might be going, hmm, what are you doing? What are you guys doing here? Um, although all of us kind of interface with technologists in, in more or, or less robustly uh, technical ways. Um, but, you know, having spent uh, time at Sundance and now specifically at the Royal Shakespeare Company, we're thinking a lot about what does it mean to have an interdisciplinary practice? I mean, theater is, you know, one of our very oldest art forms is very interdisciplinary. Um, and how are we thinking about uh, artistic practice going forward into the future? What does the future of, of, of that kind of practice look like? And it's not easy to be in an interdisciplinary team, especially as you're forging new pathways. So you know, what are some, some ways that we can uh, think about the future and think about the now and make more inclusive, more equitable, more functional um, uh, teams? And the thing I keep going back to that we were talking about um, earlier is, um, if art is a stickier historical record than the actual written history, then what historical record are we leaving behind? Um, and how are we doing the best job that we can do? Um, because we have a very long history of theater. We have 500 years of the printing press. We've got um, you know, more than 100 years of film. And we've still got some pretty major ecosystem problems. Um, you know, if we think about the World Economic Forum is now saying we've got this next wave is the fourth industrial revolution, right? So what are the prices that we've paid for past uh, rounds of revolution, uh, industrial revolutions, uh, industrialization? What bills are we now paying to, uh, to pay for, for what we've done in the past? And what could we have done to create some stop gaps, to create some uh, firewalls? What wisdom were we not listening to? What wisdom were we not valuing in the past? Uh, that we now are having to pay for. Um, and, you know, the incredible uh, Kamal Sinclair uh, did a, a beautiful research project called Making a New Reality. I really suggest checking it out around um, the future of emerging media and inclusion. Um, and, uh, you know, she tells this story about the Space Shuttle Columbia. Does anybody know why the Space Shuttle Columbia crashed? Oh, ring. So I get that answer always. So they did a study. Do you have a different answer? Was it no. It was a mix of unit measurements. Mix of unit measurements. Anybody else? So I usually get that kind of answer. Well, they did a study, and the reason that the Space Shuttle Columbia crashed was a lack of diversity of thought. So they didn't create the kinds of teams where different sort of people had different kinds of input and felt like they could speak up if they had a different idea. So literally, the reason that it crashed was a lack of diversity of thought. Um, and Thomas Wester, who many of us up here have collaborated with, um, uh, we asked him about this, actually. And he um, said, art is often most interested in, in the question, technology mostly in the solution and opportunity. And technology is powerful. It creates hubris and overestimates its importance in the world and humanity. And this infects the worldview of a technologist. And Thomas is a technologist. I mean, that's what he does by trade. Working with artists and the humanities helps expand the technologist's understanding of humanity. Um, which I thought was really interesting, because I asked him, well, what was the value of um, working with people who do not know at all what it is that you do, um, oftentimes with movement and dance and, and physical embodiment? Um, and that's what he had to say. This is actually um, a project, and I should have mentioned, all of these images are from various projects uh, that we've been working on, but this was a project um, that was actually a resonant. Uh, uh, yeah, it was, um, am I on? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, an artist's uh, residency component of volumetric performance toolbox because we wanted to make sure that, you know, spread this uh, possibility for artists during the lockdowns to, to create their own uh, performances um, from their home. So we had a remote residency and shipped um, kits to artists around um, the United States. And so this one of the elements is actually um, created by Antoine Hunter, who is a, a local, um, a deaf uh, Bay Area uh, choreographer, uh, with uh, Catherine Ross, who's a creative technologist and a mover, 
um, based in Oregon, and Ta Marianne Talavera, who is based in um, New York, uh, who's a technologist. So they did this collaboration, having never met each other. And we were able to showcase the work both in Mozilla Hubs um, for a, a live audience, as well as project it on the um, public facing um, windows of the Abrams Art Center in New York. <clears throat> Pretty incredible. Um, and then Robin uh, Elliott from the Harvard, Harvard Business School, um, uh, who's a researcher, said that we need to be thinking more about not necessarily growth and, and shareholder value, but how are we thinking about success in terms of a broader vision, encompassing learning, innovation, creativity, flexibility, equity, and human dignity? Um, so these are the things that I'm thinking a lot about uh, right now as we're kind of diving deep in, into these larger questions. Um, and I'd love to talk with you all about them. Um, so, you know, we hear a lot from artists who are like, I have this idea, I have a sense, how do I find the technologist? Or technologists who say, well, I work for a company, like how do I get involved? Or what, what needs to be done? Or I'm an executive at a company, how do I get involved with, with this, these kinds of projects? So I'm curious, um, you know, what's the genesis, what's the spark, how do people find each other? What, what has been the experience for, for you all? Um, complete serendipity and um, a lack of strategic thought. Um, uh, just going to call it um, out there. Um, uh, I emailed Intel's help desk in and, and, um, um, 2013 and ended up with a beautiful, um, beautiful show that um, commemorated the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. So I think that there is absolute sense of audacity and connection and you can never ever underestimate connecting with people and saying they're brilliant it's it's just a human connection and it's really fundamental important and sometimes we can overthink this and go what's my what's your strategy what technology are you innovating what what this what that and actually when you connect with people that are passionate about what they do that whether you work in tech or whether you work as an artist or whether you work as in any industry actually cross industry collaboration comes to be together best when you have that human connection with each other the challenges are always insurmountable if that you, you look at something and go, let's do something together and see, see where we go. And then you, then you start to unpick that and then you go, well, what's your priority? Well, what's your priority? But literally, yeah, that show came about when um, our artistic director went, I want to do something really different with this play. This play is Shakespeare's most innovative, magical, it's his last play he ever did. It's a love letter to, for, between a father and a daughter, and I would like to make this play relevant to now. And so Intel were doing a keynote in Las Vegas um, at CES, and I, sent, I saw this beautiful um, keynote which had a whale that came out. Everyone does whales, but it came out over your head, and, and it looked magical. And of course it's smoke and mirrors, but theatre works in smoke and mirrors all the time. Like, we make you believe this is a story and we make you believe this is magic and we make you believe things and some of this technology is about making you believe something different. And so um, that's, that's where this particular collaboration started. Um, and I suppose what I'm saying, whatever scale you work at, that, that is a fundamental universal truth. Um, I've never met an engineer in a technology company that hasn't been incredibly fascinating and passionate and curious and interesting and I absolutely see that with artists so if you put this technology in the hands of artists and work with those engineers poets and engineers need each other and you find that that innovation lens um, that's that's where you start I would completely agree with that um, I think there's it's twofold like first you need the platform or structure on which some something can happen like a stage or a theater um, or some kind of structured program which I try to create but then it's about finding your people and finding people who are excited about the idea of collaboration or the idea in front of them um, it's about being curious and meeting all kinds of people and finding the champions so you know I found a champion in 
one of the faculty members who worked at HAI who was able to create a specific visiting artist program in HAI and also knew all of the faculty members and um, engineers and technologists within HAI. So then I found um, artists who wanted to work in that space with those technologists and I, I found many of them through Ruthie and Kamal and Sundance and those networks. Um, and then you, you kind of, you make the match and you find the people who are excited and interested who are willing to just get on board and work with you. And, and I love that idea of there's, you see something cool and you just start pulling that thread. Mm -hmm. I know Valencia, you've talked about that. You come from a dance background initially, you know, this idea yeah. of curiosity. Can you talk a little yeah. bit more about how you got started? Yeah, for me, it was, again, yeah, that personal connection. Um, so Botan Wagner um, also happens to be my um, partner in life. And um, we were both really interested in, at that time, the buzzword was disruptive technologies. Um, and just hearing more about, you know, he was coming here, we were living in Hungary at the time, he was coming to Silicon Valley, and then we were, you know, discussing like what, what we were finding. And um, we just got right like that, um, we had a platform to, to like dig deeper. So it was a, a residency where it was specifically about for um, people in dance to collaborate with people outside of dance. So it's called, it, the residency was um, called Research into the Unknown. Um, and it was uh, organized by the workshop foundation in Budapest. And so there, you know, just having actually, you know, it was a, you know, coming together of many very nice um, circumstances. You had the interest, but you also had the space and time. And then we did like, an open call to technologists and we found this whole community of creative technologists in Hungary who actually had been working for years with, in theater. And these are, you know, people who are just interested and they're like part artists, part technologists. And, you know, they, they've, been, they've been doing this type of work. So it was just a really great um, convergence of, of, of the, those conditions. Yeah, and we're seeing, you know, early development opportunities for people to be able to play are, are rapidly dwindling in this moment in time. That's a very crucial moment in time. Um, so, you know, that kind of having that space uh, is crucial and having those kind of people come together with an open curiosity and, and play. Um, I'm curious then how, how do you build teams from there? How do you get over the language barrier? I mean, engineers speak a very different language than a poet, than a dancer, than um, you know, a technologist. How does that work? How do you build the teams? How do you get over those language barriers? Well, I mean, we deal with quite a difficult writer in residence already. Shakespeare, he's um, 400 years old, and um, you know, there is a, revisions. Yeah. There, there's yeah. exactly, um, and there's a translation issue. You could argue with that. Um, but we found, so we reached out to, I mean, this was a long time ago, but we reached out to Intel and, and we said, this, we, we really liked what you did. And then we just invited them over to Stratford and we spent time together. And in that moment, um, started out sharing our practice and sharing how, you know, how we make a piece of work and who the, you know, intro an introduction to the concept of what we wanted to explore. And we were really lucky enough um, that there were a group of people coming over from Intel engineers, but there was this really brilliant uh, moment where um, we were just talking and suddenly one of the engineers from Intel went, do you know we have enough real-time processing power to render a digital avatar in real time? And we were like, what? <laughs> what? The, the, the theatre practitioners were like, I just didn't know what that sentence oh, meant. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and you were Thanks like, that's great. And we were like, that's great. <laughs> and in that very polite British way that we do, yeah, yeah great, great, great. I have no idea what you just said. Um, and then um, he said it again, do you know we have enough real time processing power to render a digital avatar in real time? And we were like, still don't quite know what he said. And then someone went, oh, you. It, you know, and then he explained it, and, and then it landed, and you went, oh, you mean puppetry? And suddenly it connected, where we were like, oh, that's how you puppet a character. It was like, oh, well, we do it like this, and you do it with, you know, dots and things like that. And I say this really jokily and really sort of, like, simplistically, but actually we overcomplicate. 
we create acronyms, we create language that makes us sound sophisticated, but actually when you get in a room with people and you want to break down those barriers, it is about the simplification of that communication and listening and taking a beat to go, what did that person say? And I would argue that that engineer who had never made a piece of theatre helped us make one of the most innovative, ambitious pieces of work that we had ever created, and it was thanks to them. And no one person makes a piece of theatre. No one person takes credit for that. It takes, it's a shared experience. It requires an audience. It requires a community to make it, and it requires people coming into that environment for us to innovate. Otherwise, we're not relevant. And that's really crucial. And in an age that we're in around digital technology, it's really important we're part of that conversation. So we've held shared space for centuries as theatre practitioners and storytellers, but we're also really aware of the absolute um, cycles of storytelling and where we find our stories now. So the privilege of working with the tech industry or any other industry for us means that we broaden this scope. And this piece of work in particular reached a massive range of people and audiences and unlocked for us the capabilities to be much more confident in this space. And we welcomed audiences, traditional audiences, in through the Shakespeare and they came out with the wonder of the technology. And we, we welcomed younger audiences into this space through the technology. And they walked away. And their, most often, their favorite part was the drinking scene. And there's no technology in that. And that's a beautiful alchemy that I think is possible when we look at diverse teams and interdis interdisciplinary practice. And the, the more space that allows us for that removes this binary world that actually this generation is coming into and I can't think of anything more welcoming and important than, than that intersectionality. And that's, that's not easy, I mean, yeah, that's not easy coming into this kind of conversation where you literally don't, when you have a shorthand, you literally don't speak each other's languages, case in point. Um, you have to spend that time, and it almost feels like, oh, but that's wasted time having to learn about each other's workflows, but that's in, in residency so, what you guys Yeah, do. time is so necessary, but it's also often the, the biggest challenge when everybody has their own work to do, and you know, we t we've talked about how artist time is different than if you're trying to get out a product by a certain time, or you know, the commercial world. It's just different ways of working. Um, that need to be adjusted for. And it takes a certain kind of openness and willingness and understanding of one another's fields to really be able to make that work. And so it does take the right kind of people and um, the right attitude going in, kind of understanding shared goals and setting those out from the outset and having open communication throughout is critical. Yeah, I would add that um, I found the most powerful um, part of the collaborations I've done is when we were just in the same space, um, particularly for the first one where we were, like, we were you know, working with technologists, working with uh, machine learning, and then there are the technologists who work with like rendering, real-time rendering. We had a lot going on. And then the dance, and how do we build those bridges? How we, we needed to find new workflows. We needed to... You know, like we said, like understand like different lingos. We need to create a new language, a new new uh, terminology, just to um, you know to move forward in the process. And I think that that in itself was magical. But you know, we had to spend time together. Um, it was really interesting doing uh, creating the volumetric performance toolbox because that came out of the uh, pandemic, and so then we had to figure out how to do that remotely. Um, and I want to say like, it, that we, we kind of brushed through the, past this uh, quite a bit since we've figured it out, but we hadn't met each other live for like a year and a half, two, almost two years since we started the work. And, you know, it was just a testament to, to the magic uh, when you find the right people, you know, when you find people like Thomas Wester and, and Sor Bluey and Simon Bowles, um, you know, when, when we actually finally got together in the same space, it was, you know, things really clicked. It was like um, something seamless. So I feel like it's just having like that openness and then also the, um, the funding to actually help that, you know, um, 
and also the the kind of infrastructures of of like residencies, I think really make all the difference. And also, um, the people who 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 are um, offering this type of space to understand like the process, the importance of the process, um, has made all the difference. Yeah, I would say that there's kind of yeah, there's two more elements to making it all work. Um, one, I mean, I think time is, is the most critical um, because sometimes when, if an artist is kind of dropped into this space and is trying to navigate um, new technologies, it feels like they're, they need something from the engineer <coughs> technologist. And, and if the engineer doesn't understand it feels like they just are, are giving, you know, it's a one-way exchange. They're giving their technical expertise and knowledge. Um, and it can also feel extractive from the artist. If the artist keeps getting put on stage or, or you know, is expected just to make um, this product look beautiful. And there isn't that, like, real, true understanding. And so the kind of end, really important piece of the puzzle is the storytelling and like really um, sharing projects that were incredibly successful and collaborative and mutually beneficial so that everyone understands why these connections are so powerful and why these types of teams um, really do work and make everyone's project better. Mm, that's a good point. That, that also makes me think, you know, can all be R&D, right? Can all be the research and the development? I mean, yes, those opportunities are important. Spending time, learning each other's, doing, making space for that kind of research and development. I loved, um, if anybody saw the, the opening keynote today where he talked about milking a cow. You can only get so much milk and then the cow needs to go be a cow for a while, um, which I thought was a really interesting way of thinking about it. Um, it can't always be R&D. And so, you know, what happens next? What are the challenges? What does success look like coming out of that kind of process? I mean, yeah, if it goes wrong in public, it's really bad. Um, you know, you make a contract um, with an audience when you put on a piece of work. They buy a ticket, they come and see you. And one of the big things we had, if you're looking at like really cutting edge technology that you haven't used in, in, a, in, a, in that environment before, there's, there's huge amounts of vulnerability there. Like you can research and develop, but there's a point where it goes into production and it's a completely different team. And that team is trained to hold it and that team is there. It was really interesting when um, you don't realize either in collaboration, you don't realize when you're in collaboration what your superpowers are until someone different tells you that. And there's the beautiful thing about collaboration when you get it right is that you, you know what your strengths are, but you really like yourself for your weaknesses and that you understand that everyone in whatever facet has that. So our weaknesses kind of like, well, well, what do we do with these technologies and how do we push that forward? And what can the engineers, what can the technology companies help us look at this play in a really different way? And then you realize the RSC superpowers, we're in live production all the time, we're really comfortable with that. And we're really comfortable with stopping the R&D and hitting that point where it needs to meet an audience. And so it was absolutely important for us to go, we cannot have a show where this technology goes down. We just can't. And how you create a really safe environment for that technology to be held, as well as that actor or that performer to be held as well, because ultimately you want this to be a success and a beautiful, magical experience, because ultimately that audience doesn't care how you made it. It cares how it, you've made it feel. And it's that emotional connection that comes in. And then you realize it's that alchemy that you get with collaboration where you push that forward. And all the way through these partnerships, you're taking huge risk. And taking that risk with care and understanding and knowing when the different, the different people with the different skills and expertise come in. But there's a very different process with research and development and exploration and discovery. And then the, when that production comes in, you still are discovering and you make that show until it hits press night. And that's when you lock a show in. But ultimately, that show is a gift and a contract with an audience. And it's your audience that also is part of that collaboration as well. Well, it's interesting too, though, because you were rethinking what a stage could be. You know, during the pandemic, you had 
there wasn't a main stage to be on that was available to the public. So, you know, being online, you had to bring, rethink kind of those processes and bring people in much sooner. So that's another thing is, you know, bringing in people that you might not think to bring in at that point way earlier in the process. Um, you know, I, I loved a story about they brought in a stage manager and the technologists were like, we don't know what a stage manager does, not realizing that they have this incredible ally who has this incredible wealth of knowledge. And they still deal in pen and paper. That's how they call the show. Literally, you get like a, a notebook and you're calling it in paper. But this and you couldn't make it without both sides. No. But there was a beautiful moment in that particular piece where um, when we were designing it, um, we were looking at a character, so it was all in Unreal Game Engine, and we were making all our characters um, through, through that, that technology. And the, the um, director was like, well, we're going to make um, Puck move. And Puck was made out of rocks, and literally the, the programmer went, but rocks don't move. And we were like, hmm they do in this show, they do in this show. And then there was another one we were dealing with fireflies and like, fireflies don't do that. And we were like, they do in this show. So it's sort of like, you do need a longer, a longer production process to deal with like really quite serious um, practical methods of making the work. So in that sense, clicks and eyeballs and butts and seats are, are a success. What, what are some other ways that our challenges or successes? I, I mean, in, in the future, I would just, I would love to see an artist embedded in every program and department, and that just to become the norm. I mean, everybody w invites artists into their practice and the, understands that artists do research and the artists will contribute to the field in a different way and, and they'll be able to build relationships over time and it'll just become the norm that there are jobs and paid positions for artists in in companies in you know it's it's valued in the work of artists is valued in a very different way than our economic systems have supported them in the past um, and it yeah these interdisciplinary exchanges just become regular practice for everyone and I loved the, the, you know I asked this question earlier and you said impact in the world the impact that it makes. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. Which is a huge challenge, too, in terms of you're counting butts and seats. It's a different way of measuring success than how do you measure the long tail of impact over time? Or how, how art moves you. How do you, how do you quantify that? How do you prove, like, what's the proof point? So we're trying to figure things like that out. So that's a huge question around evaluation and success. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> that's a tangent yeah. we won't get to today. Oh, yeah. All of, all of the above. Um, because, yeah, the, the, the reason why I make work is, is that there is that impact. Um, and for me, I mean, it, it, is, it is hard to, to actually um, quantify the impact, but I do see it, you know, when, you know, someone who's seen the work um, or has been impacted by it comes back and, and, um, and speaks about it or, you know, lets me know, I think, and also to, for, for me, I think what I'd like to see is art, more artists empowered to, to take risk and, um, and, and have these kind of interdisciplinary um, collaborations. Because um, I feel like when, you're, when we come away from the myth that the artist must work alone and it must be you know, only one person gaining all the credit, um, when we can come away from that and realize and understand how much of a community effort it is and, and put the, the emphasis actually, for me, and the impact is there where you've, you come away from a project with a community, I feel like that is, that is more powerful. I feel that can bring us further towards like understanding success in another way. Um, and, and, and actually experiencing impact in that way. I think that impact is a really interesting word when we look at, um, when we were working with Intel and when we work with a technology partner, there's, there's a key performance indicator, whether that's reach or different countries that you've, um, you, the, the work has gone into or press, you know, we have star ratings in theatre, so it's like how many stars did it get, so, and audiences do respond to that. But I also think it's 
a really beautiful thing not to be able to quantify sometimes. Because we're in such a data-driven world. We're in such a, like, you know, why, why does this person like this person? Because they've said they'd like cheese, but they like cheese too. Well, they must like each other. And we're in that world, and there is something beautifully messy and inquantifiable about the arts. But I know that in those moments in my life and the moments in our lives where we've experienced the arts are moments like the pandemic where we needed connection and we needed to know that we weren't alone and we were together and the moments where there's loss in your life or celebration in your life and you might share a poem, you might look at a painting, you might be in a theatre and there is a ritual within that in our society that often avoids quantifying but is hugely impactful whether that's the teacher that taught you Shakespeare at school and that made you more confident and you understood the world differently or it found you language that you were able to, to use and think about the world differently it, whether it was a story that made you in a world that you existed in made you relate to a character because no one else was like you in your school. Those are unquantifiable things that are so necessary in the tech sector, are so necessary to think about when we're evolving these new technologies. But there is something brilliant when at 7.30 you can walk into a space like this anywhere around the world and you might have a very, very warm glass of white wine or whatever your fancy is and some peanuts because that's your food because you didn't have time for dinner. And you're sitting down and you don't know anyone and you're sat next to some strangers, but you give them a look and everyone's a bit paranoid that their mobile phone might go off because you're not allowed to do that at the moment. And everyone's rustling around for that and they're shaking off their day and then the lights go out and you're together. And that is not quantifiable, but it's something that moves you and is hugely impactful. And that's what the art sector does. And that convergence with technology is utterly, utterly essential. Yeah. <laughs> Preach. And I think we'll, we'll pause there because we want to make time uh, to, to hear from you. But we, we do have a slide. You know, if you want to take a picture, you're in this room and you're thinking, I, you know, where do I fit here or what can I do? Or you're, you know, watching later. Take a quick picture, we won't get super into it, but just some, some top takeaways in terms of what, what things can be done, what, what, um, what support uh, needs to happen. That's funny, because that makes me think of um, Spotify year-end as you're thinking of your questions. Spotify year-end is like, you're a very eclectic listener, and they're like, our algorithm doesn't know what in the hell you're doing here. And it's that same kind of thing of like, why do they like each other? Um, Spotify doesn't know. Uh, as far as I go. So um, we'd love to hear, what are your questions? We just have a couple of minutes, but um, did it uh, shake anything up for you? Do you have any clarifying questions? Anything you'd like to know? Yeah. Oh, we got a mic coming. Hi, my name is Drew Morrison. I work for a little arts company called Meow Wolf, if you guys have heard of us. And we are very much at that intersection of art and technology. And I, as a formerly technologist, now product manager, have been dealing with, in the technology side of the company, and I, and I mean like kind of like the IT tech side of folks, getting past the point of, yes, this technology has some limitations, but artists love limitations, and that's a thing that we can work with. But then also talking to the artist and, showing, and trying to get some of this new technology in front of them, but the, of course, healthy skepticism that they have to some of these new platforms and like new ways of being that are outside of some of their other kinds. And it's just trying to kind of, I've, I've had difficulty trying to get the technology to understand the arts and the arts to understand the technology. And I, I appreciated that, what you were saying there about having the shared language between groups. But what are some other pieces of advice that you may have for fostering better communication, collaboration, demos, like that sort of thing for these two very different world of our artists and our, and our IT tech folks who are having to worry about the back-end software and management and operations and then the artists who are like, this is the storytelling, this is the feel of that. What advice do you guys have for working with those two groups that have very different um, kind of end goals and what they want to create, but also we're all building the same exhibitions together too. We have the same similar end goals too. This, that was probably a lot, but like, what are your thoughts? 
Um, it's it really is your like your design. You're like asking the question, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Killer <laughs> question. Um, there's a there's a lot to do with um, assumption of time and assumption of workload. So you know something that might be you know really simple to do might be perceived as very complicated and vice versa. Something that actually I, I want this I want this um, design to flip over, for example, or something like that, and the, and the um, technologist will go, that's actually a huge amount of coding hours, and that's a huge amount of time. So I think before you even get to the point of making, you really do need that, that what, you, what we missed out, like what you don't have in a regular process is like a very long design process to really look at all the different ways that you can make that work. Um, and I, I genuine, I'm genuinely at the coders who went, rocks don't move. That was like, no, it's a hard pass. But we're like, well, we want these rocks to move because it's a character. Um, um, our genuine questions and, and the onboarding of teams is super important so that you don't just go straight to like expecting a technologist just to deliver what an artist's vision is. Yeah, yeah I think knowing the, giving them both, both sides time to understand you know, really dive into the technology and this is how it works and this is how, what it was meant to do. And then this is the artist's practice, this is what they've done before, this is how they're approaching it. And then coming together and figuring out, you know, it's, it's the time and the runway as much as, as much as you can give them. And it's also good to have people like you who can be somewhat of a mediator, who can speak both languages and help kind of usher it forward. You also sort of developed those spaces. You know, we had, which both of you participated in a, a gathering at Mass Mocha that was an interdisciplinary gathering with people with very different backgrounds. And we spent like the first day and a half, two days, presenting about our work. And people started getting antsy, being like, oh, I'm not going to have time to do it. Blah, blah, blah. But it was like, no, this is a very crucial foundation that we're laying here. And it feels like a lot of time, because it's very important time that we're setting aside space to, to really have a sense of understanding. Sorry, Valencia, I cut you off. Oh, no. Oh, okay. No, I feel like it's like, I think very well said. I think what really helped, and I remember in my, the first time I was doing this type of work, we, I, I asked the dramaturg who also was uh, mentoring me um, in, in directing the piece, and it was, she, she was really helpful in that translation of like, again, like, what does this, this ask, my ask mean for, really mean for the technologists, and, 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 and what can, and for example, what do they need for their workflow that I can also um, take into consideration um, yeah, when, when, we come to, when we come together in the studio. Um, and also I'm thinking about, um, I really enjoyed having like iterate, iterative kind of uh, work uh, flow. So it's rather than one big thing where you're expecting the big ta-da moment at the end, it was really important to have like two week um, labs or sprints or uh, where there is a, a chance to invite a small like trusted community to see the work in progress and you get that feedback as well so you're incorporating audience into that workflow and you kind of break it up I found that really helped yeah so you're, you're kind of getting a sense of of doing that deep dive while still having edges on, on the R&D. Yeah. I think we have to wrap up there. I wanted to just make sure we've got um, ways to, to reach us afterwards. We'll be around here for a minute. Um, and I love the idea, of Valencia, of um, creating a, tool, a toolkit, which was one of the things that we said, oh, we've got this incredible R&D that happens, and then you know, Valencia is not necessarily a professional toolbox maker. You know, she's an artist and a dancer. And that doesn't mean it's still not one of her projects, but like, who can then take that forward? What kind of administration can happen for that to be out in the world? How are we doing that kind of knowledge exchange and be building that into processes so that we are able to build this field? You know, sometimes there was a joke that um, XR and emerging media is a, a um, oral tradition. And it's just us telling each other about it all the time. So how are we creating that kind of knowledge exchange and building those sort of toolkits? Um, great question. And thank you so much for being here today and for anybody who's watching. And, and thank you for having us. Thank you.